Hello everybody, welcome or welcome back to BNB Anime. I am Blue, that is Brad, he is sick, so give him some leeway today. Hugs yeah. for Brad. Just air hugs, no, nobody needs to no. catch this shit, please yeah. and thanks. Yeah, air hugs for Brad. And we're going to be discussing a silent voice, this is another pre-recorded podcast episode. Like I've mentioned previously, I am moving, things are happening, we don't know when these are possibly going to be used, but there's a good chance that they will be, well, they will be used within the next, like, couple months. But, um, <laughs> we are recording a few in advance, and this is another one of those, so we won't be having any news today. What? No news. No news. <laughs> who, who are we? Yeah, I know. And also, this is recorded on a whole new platform, so we're using a completely different program, a completely different software than what we normally use to record these podcasts, so things may be a little bit different. This is kind of an experimental episode. We will see how it goes. Yeah, we're, we're in the midst of a free trial. Hooray for seven <laughs> days. <laughs> we are in the midst of a free trial. Hopefully, it works out well for us, and uh, yeah, this, this may be something that we look at getting in the future. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how this episode goes, because mm -hmm. since I'm tasked with editing this, I will find out whether I hate it or whether it's going to be $50 well spent. Who the fuck knows? Who the fuck knows? We'll see. Anyway, first questions first. How you feeling after Ugh. our just two and a half hour binge? Oh, well, uh, mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, oh god. Yeah, that's how I'm feeling. Cause, Cause I can't ask how you're doing because I I know how you're doing. So instead, I'm just gonna ask how you're feeling. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot. I'm feeling a lot. Many different things. Um, I, yeah, lots of conflicting emotions and thoughts going through my brain to do with this film. Lots of things that I'm like, uh, I feel really strongly about this, but then I have this counteracting thought in my brain. The whole, you know what I mean, and. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. And I had to deal with student loan people this morning, so my brain was already on a lot, and now I'm on Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm on a lot, a lot. I mean, at, at least I warned you. That's true. Kind of. I, I don't think I warned you well enough, but I, I warned you. <laughs> hey, I, I really enjoyed the film. It's a very, very good film. Um it's, it is one of those ones that I don't think I'm ever going to watch again because, oh my God, I feel like I have the entire world on my shoulders right now. <laughs> oh, I normally I would apologize for what I put you through, but I, I can't apologize for that. Yeah, no, I need a nap, like seven of them, even though it's about to be nighttime. But like, I mean, I am. So as the friendly neighborhood doctor of the podcast, I am not a doctor. Take all of this with a grain of salt. I am going to prescribe a 12-episode binge of Tonica Kuhn. <laughs> it's Just as needed. soon as we're done with this recording session. It is needed. Or uh, Umaru-chan, since that's what you know, we're actually going to be covering the week that this is being pre-recorded. I can also highly recommend that. I think you're going to have a great time with it. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, I don't know what, uh, I haven't really, uh, not a lot's happened since the last time we recorded. We only recorded a couple of days ago. Um, oh, uh, my COVID, I got my, my final COVID vaccine. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. So I'm all vaccinated up. I, uh, did have side effects this time. The first time the only side effects I really had was really bad fatigue the day that I got it. And then a really, really sore arm. Uh -huh. This time... When I got home, on the way home, I felt kind of nauseous, but it was like for only about five to 10 minutes. So I kind of dismissed it as like, I don't know, hunger pains or like, I don't know, something like I didn't think it was anything at the time. Now I think it was probably a kind of early reaction, but it was very quick. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got home and I was fine for a few hours. My arm hurt a little bit, but nowhere near as bad as the first time. And then I... Uh, slowly started to get really cold and I couldn't warm up. And mm -hmm. then when I went to bed, my muscles were really, really sore. My joints were all sore. I felt really achy and weak. Uh, I was really dizzy every time I tried to get up. Um, and then I ended up getting a really, really bad headache. Um, and then really, really badly dehydrated, which is entirely my fault. But like I was so weak and, and, gross that I didn't get up to get drinks. Um, and then I ended up dehydrating myself, which didn't help. Um, and then, uh, so I felt really, really awful for a night. 
And then Sunday morning, when I woke up, I felt really, really bad until like 11, 12 a.m. And then um, I started to perk up a bit. I popped a couple Advils and uh, yeah, then then started to feel a little bit better. And now I'm fine. Um, it is the day after that. I'm fine. So that was, yeah, I got my vaccine on Saturday, Sunday, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning, I felt really bad. All through Saturday night, I barely slept. Um, then Sunday, I, Sunday, most of Sunday, I felt much better. Today, I'm feeling pretty much completely normal, except my arm hurts. However, my mom, who also got the vaccine on the same day as me, um, was feeling fine all Sunday until Sunday evening when she started to feel weak and gross. And then today she's felt horrible all day. So she had like a full day's delayed reaction from me. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. I know most people would get hit like the day after. Yeah. I have a super fast metabolism. I'm known to burn through things. Like when I, uh, mm. went under for surgery before I've had to, had like, more anesthesia than they would normally give a person of my size because my metabolism just rips through it really quickly. So, huh. yeah, I, um, uh, I've always had fast reactions to stuff. So, yeah, I'm kind of like the warning system for everyone in my family. <laughs> well, hopefully mom gets to feeling better. Give her my best. Mm -hmm. Also, do not bump your arm into anything. You are going to regret all of your life's decisions from oh, that point going forward. Speaking of which, I walked into a door frame today, hip first. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And now I have a blood blister on my hip from hitting it so hard. E excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> like, I I could understand a bruise. Like, a bruise, I, I get. But a blood blister, mate. Yeah. It was hip bone straight into wood door frame. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of padding, so it was, uh, yeah, skin pinch between bone and wood and yeah, blood blister. So I'm going to send you a care package of bubble wrap to go <laughs> along with your, you know, vast multitude of stuff. Your shark hoodie came in today, by the way. Oh, cute. Yeah. So I'll have all that pieced together and ready to ship out to you at some point. Cute. Yeah. But yeah, I'll make sure to include an extra shit ton of bubble wrap <laughs> because there's going to be nobody to look after you at your new place. I'm going to need you to bubble wrap everything. I know, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to need it. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I don't know. I'm not in your brain. I don't have custody of your brain this week. No. <laughs> uh no, I can't remember. I, I can't remember. I was doing, you know that squishy thing with your hands where you, like, um, fold and unfold your fingers, but you don't, like, fully clasp them into a fist? You know what I mean? No. <laughs> the only way I can describe it is, like, boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I see where you're going now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was doing that, but not outwards, like, inwards towards myself. Um, uh not that, not like that. That's no, just like in my lap. <laughs> Sorry, I, I I got some like your name flashbacks for a second. <laughs> Funny, yeah. Um, okay, I was doing so that yeah, trying to think. Lap? Okay, I was just I was trying to think, and for some reason that was helping me think, although it didn't help me clearly enough because I still don't remember what I was trying to remember. But you know, okay. <laughs> that it was irrelevant i just was think i'm doing a weird hand motion with my hands i have to talk about it that's <laughs> okay yeah squish i get it yes yeah i saw a video today about someone with adhd who woke up in the morning and went to go get coffee and breakfast and somehow ended up in the garden in their pajamas um sorting through rocks or something or like gardening i can't remember what she was doing picking beans i'm not sure um, and I was like, yeah, I understand. Interesting. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I end up in places sometimes either. See, I'm, I'm also, like, on that same track, but never to that extent. <laughs> like, ne never that far-fetched. Like, sometimes I think that I may have ADHD, but then I hear stuff like that, and I'm like, no, no, I haven't lost it that much. Yeah, <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, honestly, the, well, that's the thing with ADHD, right, is it's it's – Everything that people normally do, just that step further. Like, that's just, it's like normal people stuff, just that step further. Uh huh. Like procrastination. It's a thing that normal people do. People with ADHD are masters of it. 
Oh, so you see, that was my problem in school. I get it. I get it. Mm. Mm. I just didn't want to do homework. Too fucking lazy. Yeah. See, um, same. But like, also, I sometimes I can't. I have to be medicated to get myself to do shit on time. <laughs> you see, depending on what it is, like I won't get shit done on time. Like the podcast, for instance, there have been times where I put it off to the last minute to where even speed editing, I can't get this thing done on time. <laughs> but I on the bright like side, my speed editing has become really good. Yeah, I'm a pretty efficient in editing as well because of the podcast. I also realize every small thing that I say wrong in like just speech patterns uh-huh. ever since I've started editing a podcast. It- <sighs> The amount of times that you say things that in conversation don't make a difference, but in a podcast episode stand out so much, Mm -hmm. I I feel like we're pretty critical. I mean, we are. Like, we are going to be extremely critical on ourselves. However, I will tell you this. I have edited this thing so much to where I have the vocal wave pattern for your um and my like memorized. Same. (laughs) Like, anytime I just see that peak, I'm like, cut. Yeah. It's just to yeah. that point. Like, it's weird the kind of stuff that you find out whenever you do things like this. It's really interesting. Yeah. I know. And the amount of times I go, mm-hmm, I'm like, oh, shut up. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Perks are but doing anyway. this. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we can not just criticize ourselves physically, but also vocally. Speaking of vocally, though, a silent voice. That I like the transition. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was proud of that one. So, A Silent Voice is based off of a manga written by Yoshitoki Oima, and its original run was from August 7th of 2013 to November 19th of 2014 for a total of seven volumes, all of which Mm -hmm. I own. Mm Mm-hmm. The film was directed by Naoko Yamada, and it was produced by the... Absolutely phenomenal Kyoto animation. Shock. The big shock. Like the visuals, mm. oh, so good. Mm. Oh, absolutely loved it. The film has a runtime of 130 minutes or two hours and 10 minutes. And it did $33 million in the box office. Mm-hmm. $33 million. That's not bad. That's really not bad. I think that's kind of like on par with what My Hero 2 Heroes did, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Like, it's somewhere in that vicinity. Mm-hmm. What you got for ratings? Ah, uh, for ratings, I have... Oh, I actually... It's a PG-13, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh-huh. And um, it is an 8.98, so basically a 9 out of 10 on my enemy list, and a 4.46 out of 5, or basically a 9 out of 10 on Anime Planet as well. So yeah, anim- uh, nines, 9s out of 10s across the board, um, which I feel like is incredibly accurate. I have to disagree, but that's because mine's a point higher. Okay, okay. But again, like, there's reasoning behind that, and we'll get into my reasoning behind that Mm -hmm. a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But there is, like, up there I go again. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much that the film does right. Not only does it do it right, but it gets Mm -hmm. it right. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there there you go, there's mine. You did your like, there's my um. (laughs) Oh, Oh, I love it so much. Right. There's this. Okay. So this film covers some incredibly heavy topics. We did mention that previously, and I will go through some trigger warnings in a moment. But this, it's, it covers some incredibly sensitive and heavy topics surrounding minors and young minors as well. Not, not even like high schoolers. It's, it's through elementary and middle school that this entire thing happens through Mm -hmm. and it's there's so much in it that goes wrong that is necessary to uh, it's it's very it's frustrating the film is frustrating to watch because you're sitting there and these kids are doing stuff that they should not be able to be doing but they are Mm -hmm. 
And and it happens. That's the thing is it ha- it's so hard to talk about this without spoiling anything. But it happens in real life and you're watching it and you're so frustrated and you just you, your emotions get pulled and tugged and you don't really know how you feel about certain characters because you empathize with them but also they're such assholes. Mhm. And Okay, so before yeah. we get into this anymore, Mm-hmm. Let's just go ahead and throw on the spoiler chicken hats because I feel like we can't talk or like give a general overview other Without than spoiling everything. yeah, other than just saying that this is probably one of the greatest redemption arcs in anime of all time for our main character. Yeah, so I will give just before we do check on those spoiler chicken hats for real. I will give just a very basic um idea of what the story is about. So if you're interested, you kind of know. It's uh, based around two students, mainly, in an elementary school. Um, One of them has a disability. The other one is not a nice child. And they have some interactions between each other that then cause both of them, when they then separate as life progresses, to experience a load of trauma and um, continuous effects of what happened during that time period. It's a very difficult story to watch, so I will give you some trigger warnings right now for... I'm going to give you general trigger warnings, and then I'm going to go and say what those trigger warnings are, so if any of these words are triggering to you, I'm a... Yeah, just so you know, big triggers throughout this whole movie. If it's not for you, click off now. Specific triggers, I'm going to say, for suicide, bullying, and neglect. Those are the three that I can think of, but there are chances are that there are some more in there that I just haven't recognized as others, so be aware when watching this. Maybe if you're not sure if this is something for you, go on Wikipedia, look up some more about the film, or listen to the rest of this podcast if you don't mind spoilers. Um, because we will be going over it and then you can see whether or not this is something that you would be okay with watching. But yes, heavy, heavy subject matter to do with minors. Okay. <laughs> Trigger warnings out of the way. Let's get those spoiler chicken hats on. Spoiler chicken hats. Mm-hmm. All right. So the main like takeaway that you can kind of have with the first bit of this film is the accuracy that they have of kids. Yeah. Like, it's uncanny. Now, there's a lot that they did wrong. Or not that they did wrong, but, like, uh, it's hard to put into words. It's so... I agree. uh, Like, it's hard to sit down and talk about. But at the same time, like, they handled everything beautifully yeah i i think that they did such a good job especially considering that they i'm just going to double check but i really do think that this is a pg-13 um yes it is okay okay so, i was gonna say like it, it yeah holds that boundary very very well and that i think was so smart because the main age that these kids are is 13 years old you know they're in middle school by this point so they're what 13 14 so around that time sixth grade so they're 11 um, 11 and then their senior year of high school is so, it senior year of high school yeah okay. because remember uh shoko turns 18 at the fireworks right. festival yeah, yeah yeah okay so yeah so so, so it yeah 11 and then like 18. a massive gap so th- 13 years old for me is, like, PG-13, is the perfect age to be introducing subject matter like this. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of film that I think should be shown in schools instead of those stupid bullying campaigns. Because this shows you how detrimental it can be to the fullest effect Mm -hmm. to both parties. And... It's one of those ones where I think it would allow students to become more empathetic to each other without feeling like they're being lectured. Mm -hmm. So this, I think them making this a PG-13, them sticking to it being a PG-13, was a fantastic choice of the producers and directors. Oh, 100%. Also, I love 
the kind of swerve they gave us with almost making it like a love story, Mm -hmm. but keeping it away from that and turning it into just like redemption. Yeah. It's the kind of thing where you feel like it's the prequel to a romance story. But the fact that it never went there. like It's a very smart choice, I agree. It's That's why I can solidly give this a 10. Because yeah. they didn't cheap out and try to... Make you feel bad for him because they love each other. Like, yeah. that's, yeah. Like, instead, it's just a story of being an asshole and doing everything you possibly can to get forgiveness. And then I... I cannot express, like, how hard that final scene hit me. Yeah. Like, just, oh, my God. Like, it, uh. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let's, I guess we'll get into it, and then we can talk more about individual opinions about certain things as we go through. So, we're starting off with the opening scene of our main character. I don't actually have my character sheet list to double-check those names. So, yeah. Yeah, Uh, yeah, show ya. And, okay. Um, so Shoya is, uh, on the edge of a bridge, the standing on the ledge of a bridge in in the opening scenes. And it looks as though he's going to jump off. He has this calendar that has an end date on it. He's ripped off the rest of the pages. He is, he gave his, you don't know who this person is, but he gave someone money and said, I've paid you back and all this kind of stuff. And, um, it's very... Uh, it's a very stern start to a film. Um, it kind of gives you an idea of where we're going right from the get-go. You know, you're Mm. not, it doesn't play around with how serious this film is. It doesn't give you a false idea of, um, this, uh, of the film not being taken lightly. You have to take it seriously from the initial opening scene. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but the animation is simplistically beautiful. If that makes sense. Like, the character designs are very simple in a way. At times, they are just very, very pretty. Mm Mm-hmm. But they just do a phenomenal job of introducing everything and just setting the tone just for everything else that you're going to experience. Mm-hmm. So... From there, we then go into one of my favorite bands of all time. I was not expecting to hear The Who come over, <laughs> come over and start playing. And this is, I have, I had t-shirts of The Who when I was in high school. I have this particular album, the track, the album that this track is on, on record, on vinyl. Uh, it's, it's one that I grew up listening to. My parents are huge fans. Was not expecting to hear The Who during this. But yeah, my generation started playing. I was like, okay. I figured you would love that. Yeah, no, it was it was very shocking, and I sang every word. It was great. I love that. That was so good. Oh, that's great. I actually got out my notebook specifically to write that down, because I was like, oh, wow, okay, cool, note, written. <laughs> and we are in their elementary or early middle school, either last year of elementary or first year of middle school, I don't know. And I think for Japan, it's last year of elementary, because it's okay. like one through six. 7 through 9, and then 10 through 12. That's how it should be in Canada, but I went to a weird school that did it 1 through 5, 6 through 8. Then you did 9 at the high school, but you weren't technically in high school until grade 10. Well, that's fucking weird. It was so weird. It was so weird, yeah. So I did I did my grade 9 year, and I was like, I'm in high school! And all of the other students, the older students were like, you're not in high school yet, not until next year. And I'm like, but I'm in the same building and use the same classrooms as you and my locker is right next to yours. They're like, but you're not in high school yet. Okay, fine. So you want to hear something weird? What? The school I went to for seventh grade was separated K through six and seven Hmm. through 12. Odd. Yeah, very odd. There was a school that was attached to my middle school that was a K-12. to And then there was the Christian Academy just up the road from the high school that was K-12 through as well. And they were the only other schools in the area. Huh. And one of them was Catholic, one of them was Christian, and then if you went to the public school, you had to go in that system. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. 
There are other schools now, but because, you know, the area is expanding quickly. But when I were a kid, no. And there's still only the one high school in town. There's still only the, even though there's like two middle schools now, two elementary schools, there's still only one high school. And so all of the kids are like having to go to the city because they can't stay here because the high school's not big enough. Huh. And it's right just down the road from the cop shop. Uh They built the new cop shop literally like two blocks away from the high school. (laughs) They were like, those teenagers. Those damn teenagers. Those damn teenagers. (laughs) Okay. But yeah, okay. So we're in elementary school and we are... The whole film is set from the perspective of Shoya, who is our male main character. And he is the one that was obviously on the bridge, gonna jump. And he sees in the, in this classroom that they are being introduced to a new student. This new student comes in, uh, Shoko, and she is deaf. So she uses a notebook to communicate with them and says that she can't speak to them. She can't hear. She can speak, but obviously she has never heard. So her speaking is limited at this time as well because she's so young as she gets older she's probably gonna get well she does get better at it but at this time it she doesn't have that same she's still learning sign language like she's learning two languages as it is like let her be and also (laughs) Mm -hmm. fun fact Mm -hmm. they hired a deaf voice actress to play shoko oh that's good i'm glad right like that's yeah that's such phenomenal attention to detail. Yeah. No, that's good. I'm glad. Happy to hear that. But then, very quickly, we see Shoya not really understanding her and not understanding... It's it's very easy to see as an adult watching this film that he is just confused and weirded out and and scared of the fact that she is different Mm -hmm. and so he takes that out on her and starts bullying her this is where i get so uncomfortably angry because no teachers stepped in they watched it from day one they did not step in the teacher didn't even assist her in class he left it up to the other students in class to assist her because she obviously can't listen to lectures, yet he was facing away from her writing at the board, didn't even make sure to turn her so she could lip read if she needed to. He gave her no assistance, left it up to all of the other students. They felt like it was their obligation, like they their responsibility to do that. They felt like it was unfair that they had this responsibility to look after her, which then progressed this idea that she was bad for them. She was not what they needed because like, Oh, I know, who's one of these students who ended up contributing to her bullying. She initially started to help out um, Shoko, but very quickly realized that her grades were falling and dropping because she wasn't able to pay attention to the lectures herself because she was so busy helping Shoko with her work because the teachers were not giving her the support that she needed. So then all of the other, so then when Shoya starts bullying her, the other students start egging him on because they are also feeling these same uncomfortable, unknown feelings. Shoko takes it. She just takes it all. She believes that it's her fault from day one. She th- she's always apologizing. She understands that she's making them uncomfortable, that, that they don't want to have this responsibility. So she's blaming herself internally. It quickly progresses because they're not being told off. They're not being sorted and they're being left to their own devices. So then Shoko and, en- uh, Shoya ends up hurting Shoko physically, like, like hurting her. He, ruins her hearing aids several times. I think it was like eight pairs of hearing aids in in five months or something. Mm -hmm. And then eventually her mom's like, "Uh, you know, she's had all of this stuff broken. I think that she is being bullied or harassed at school. I'm pulling her out of school. And then the principal comes into the classroom and he says, has any of you seen anyone being bullied, uh, bullying her? And the teacher says, Stand up, Shoya. We know it was you. We all know it was you. You did this. 
He then stands up and says, but it wasn't just me. There were other people that were contributing to this. They all say, no, it was just you. We know it was you. How could you do this? You're disgusting. And he is then isolated and ostracized from his classroom because the teacher did nothing the entire time. And then when somebody comes and calls them out on it, he points a finger at an 11-year-old. Mm-hmm. I cannot... It, it, those children were not at fault. I understand that Shoya was really, really bad. He was a bad child. He did bad things. So did a lot of the other students. But those children, I cannot blame them because they were not regulated. They were not monitored. They were not cared for in the way that they needed to be as children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of those situations of most of the blame falls on the teacher. 100%. Now, the kids are assholes. Yes, period. agreed. And the kids yeah. reacted in a way that kids would actually react if they were yeah. put in a situation like that. Yeah, well, they're scared. They're terrified. They don't want to be in trouble. Mm, well, not only that, but just, like, the way that they treated Shoko in general, too. Yes. Like, they were all put in, like, they were just. They were given no support, no support, and so they did what they felt they needed to do mm -hmm. in a in a survival environment. I think this is the thing, it's just that these kids see this, they see their world as so important. Like, all of the minor things that as adults we see as just, oh, it's just a day. To them, it's everything, right? Mm -hmm. So they see, they're trying to figure out their hierarchy. You know, we like to think that we're such a progressive society, but we're really not. We we base a lot of stuff off of our, off of our survival instincts, mm -hmm. especially as children. Human nature is human nature, and I've I've had like a weird thought here recently about yeah. why time seems so much you know shorter as an adult than as a kid. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> if you think about it, whenever you're ten years old. Like, you only have 10 years' worth of experience to base your life off of, so a year feels like it's forever long. Yeah. But then you get to our age, like 25, like how old I am right now, mm -hmm. and instead of only experiencing 10 years, we've had 25 whole years. Yeah. So the concept of time, it just feels like it's shrinking because we've experienced so much of it. Mm hmm And so it's... You know, it's one of those things whenever you're that young and something, you know, new and uh, trying to think of the right word, brain not working. Anyway, whenever you're put in a situation like they were with having, you know, someone brought into the class that's deaf and they're having to help her along, like you said, because the teacher is doing absolutely nothing to help her. Just so much of the blame falls on the school for putting Shoko in a situation of not putting her in the environment that's best for her to learn. And that's one thing I feel like Japanese schools, whether it be from an anime perspective, you know, you're typically taught is, you know, kids are always put in environments and classes, like separated in a way that's going to be best for them to learn. Like they're always going to be put in you know, situations that's going to be best for them. Mm -hmm. And that is not what happened here at all. No. And they, I don't know, like the kids just acted how kids would have in that situation. And it's, it's just crazy how accurate this is and how just fucked up the whole situation is. Yeah. It's as someone that, like, I, when I emigrated from the UK, I was 10 years old. When I first, the, my first year in school was grade six over, over here in Canada. So I was their age. I know exactly how it feels to be the odd one out in a new classroom at that age. I had an accent. I had a uh, different language. The way I spoke, I asked to go to the bathroom one time and I asked to go to the loo and my teacher called me out on it in front of the whole class. And that is a memory that is ingrained in my brain because I was so embarrassed. I just wanted to go to the toilet. I forgot that I had to say washroom and just said what was naturally came to my mind. And it's 
so ingrained in my brain that moment, despite the fact that, it, like now, as an adult, would not be embarrassed. As a kid, it was my entire world. Mm -hmm. And it's just because stuff like that is traumatizing. Like, there's so much of middle school that I'm not going to be able to forget. Yeah. Because middle school is such a weird time because there's so much development and hormones and so much stuff that goes on in that period of time. Yeah. That every small inconvenience is, you know, things that we would see now as an inconvenience can just ruin an entire perspective of something. It and shapes so, your whole future. Oh, it does. And with especially with someone that deals with high amounts of anxiety mm -hmm. and whatnot, like I I absolutely detest my memories of middle school. Like yeah. that is times of my life to where if I could forget it, I fucking would in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And again, it all just comes down to the fact of, you know, kids during that time are trying, again, it's like we touched on earlier, trying to establish a hierarchy and kids are fucking assholes. Yeah. Especially when left unregulated and unchecked. And there's, and especially whenever it comes to bullying, like there's so much that doesn't, you know, get done for kids that are bullying. Like, it's odd how shit like that just isn't. It's, it, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those situations where in this movie, I'm so frustrated at the adults because I can't find it within myself to blame the children because they are that. They are, they are children. And they, Yes, they should know better. But if they have not been taught better, they cannot know better. So, yes, they should know better. <laughs> that is true. They should. But if no one said to them, this is how you deal with someone who is different from you, how are they supposed to know? They can't just pluck that out of thin air. You have to be taught as a kid. And they, these kids were not taught. The people that were supposed to teach them failed them. And because of that, Shit hit the fan, and two students ended up severely depressed because of it. Mm, like, two students were, you know, they'll forever have lifelong scars because adults refuse to intervene. And, again, like, kids left in that situation are just going to be assholes. Yeah. Because it's, kids are very much... In the mindset of, I'm going to, you know, continue to push boundaries until I'm, you know, reprimanded in some shape, form, or fashion. So they're going to continue to push and push and push until repercussions come because they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. That's how they learn. Mm -hmm. And so just the fact that they are never taught, you know, kids are going to be kids and kids are going to be assholes. However, you can discipline them in some shape, form, or fashion. To, you know, let them know where those boundaries are and not to cross them. And also, you know, nurture them into being decent human beings. Yeah, it's it's like putting a bunch of kids in a field and telling them that there are mines in the ground and good luck. You know, they don't know where those boundaries are if you don't show them where the boundaries are. Mm hmm so how are they supposed to know when they're walking through the field where they're supposed to stop before the mines start? And then all of a sudden they walk into the minefield, one goes off, and you look at the other kid and you say, that's your fault. No, it's not. It's not the kid's fault. <laughs> and so, yes, this is incredibly frustrating. And I feel like at every single age that you watch this film, if you watch this film at 13, you would not see that it was the it was not the kid's fault. At 13 years old, you would watch this and you'd say, those kids are dicks. At 15 years old, you would watch this maybe and you'd say, that teacher was a dick, but the kids were still dicks. At 18 years old, you would say, I would have done this different. I did. I would have done that different. At 25 years old, when your brain is fully developed, hopefully you would say they're children. Leave them alone. You know? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like this movie is such a good lesson for all of the different age groups and watching it again and again and again throughout your time of development until your brain is fully developed. And my brain is not fully developed. I think my opinion's probably going to change in the next two years because I am not 25 yet. 
<laughs> I am but, 25. Hooray. Yeah, you have a fully developed brain. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so maybe my opinion will change in, in a, a year and a couple months' time. I don't know. We'll see. So we're re-watching this in a year and a couple of months. Yeah, in November of 20... whatever the year will be. <laughs> 2022. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, It's, yeah, it's like, it's, uh, okay. So anyway, moving on. She leaves the school. Shoya is now ostracized to the point where he is being bullied. He is being thrown in the ponds that she was thrown in. He is being... Uh, thrown rocks at. He's he's his he his mom is crying because of it. She gets her earring ripped out of her ear by Shoko's mom. Which also, I understand that his kid, her kid, bullied your kid. But what the fuck? Yeah. Also, can can we just say, Shoya's mom is best mom. Yes. Just. So squished. Like, her voice actress was just played everything to a T. Just yeah. so sweet. Like, she t- she dealt with a lot. Yeah. And just never changed. I think we, we never see Shoya's father, so it's easy to assume that he is not in the picture for whatever reason. So... Shoya's mom is working full time. He was kind of left to his own devices. That is also probably a contributing factor to why he pushed Shoko so far because he wanted attention as a kid and uh, wasn't getting it at home. And so went to school, tried to get attention from adults, was not getting it, was not getting it, pushed and pushed and pushed. He was getting backed up by all of his friends, so thought it was fine, because the only people that were telling him whether or not it was okay were his friends, and they were saying it was okay. So he kept going for it. You know what this kind of reminded me of? What? Do you remember the flashback of ReZero, whatever Subaru is talking to his dad? Mm Mm-hmm. And, like, that conversation of, you know, you just always feel like you have to one-up yourself, otherwise you're going to fall by the wayside. Yeah. And so I feel like that's what he was doing. And even, Mm -hmm. like, his interactions with Shoko, like, it went from, like, you know, curiosity and almost, like, you know, kids, you know, flirting, if that makes sense. Like, that kind of playfulness to just all-out bullying. Because, again, there's no, like, there's no boundaries that have been set. Yeah. And, again, it was all just in an effort to get attention. And you even see that with the way that he interacts with his friends. Like, it all just kind of slowly escalates up and up and up. Yeah. And the manga is a very good showcase of that as well. Because the manga goes a little bit more in-depth with that kind of stuff and his, you know, relationships with his friends. And also, I hate that they left out a whole section of the manga of uh, Shoya and... Uh, Green Afro. Mm-hmm. There was a whole section in the manga where Green Afro decides that he wants to be a movie director, and so he shoots a film, and you see none of that. <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, <Aww. laughs> like um, it, it's entirely a filler arc. But oh my god, I'm so upset they didn't put it in there because it was like it was a decent chunk of the manga. Like it was at least a couple of chapters, I think. Specials. There are specials. Based on the manga, a limited edition of the Blu-ray disc for Kyoto Animation film adaptation includes two bonus animation videos. Huh. We're going to have to find those and watch those at some point. Oh, yeah, that's right, because there's another scene after the fucking festival, too. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what's what consists of those, but yeah, there's a couple specials. So oh my maybe God, it's on that's there. right. I forgot about the fucking scene after the festival in the manga. Oh, my God. So, okay, so he's ostracized. We then jump forward into high school. He is started seeing everyone with X's over their faces in, in the sense that he, he is filling, 
what else did we watch where somebody is was there there in their mind they had filled in the perspective of what everyone else was saying i want to eat your pancreas that's the one Same and thing. this is very much one of those situations although i will say in no other anime would or would no other production company fill in the faces but Kyoto Animation animated every single face under those X's. Yes. And that is did. such a just beautiful little touch mm-hmm. that just kind of, you know, takes it that much more because it just goes to show that although, you know, he's hearing these things of, you know, people bad mouthing him, there are actually people under those. Yeah. So it's such a it's such a nice little touch. Again, just mm, chef's kiss. Mm-hmm. So He's seeing everyone. He's hearing them talk about him. Some of them are actually talking about him. Some of them are not. And he's adding it into his brain. Some of the people that he goes to school with know about what happened in elementary. Some of them don't. Some of them are just new people that he doesn't know. He sits alone every single day. And he is so upset. He's so depressed. So he's got this countdown. He goes to try and kill himself. He then backs out of killing himself and he ends up going to the school for sign language and bumping into Shoko again, where he asks her if they could be friends. She runs away from him, <laughs> freaks out. And then she basically tells him, I feed the, the koi fish at this particular spot every Tuesday. And kind of leaves it up to him as to whether or not he wants to come or not. And it's kind of left pretty open-ended. At that same time, at school, he is kind of... He finds himself sitting next to um, a a, the BFF (laughs) called uh, Nagatsuka. And he... They kind of are both loners together. And then one day after school, his bike is going to be stolen... And Shoya says, hey, you can take my bike if you want. And the dude takes his bike. And then that's when he goes, sorry, to the school for sign language. And then when he's walking home, he bumps into Nagasuka again, who tells him, who has his bike and says, I've been looking all over for you. I've been looking for all over your bike. It's I'm so glad it had your address on it. I found it. He left it in a rice field. Here you go. And then they kind of become friends, but Shoko, uh, Shoya, sorry, has no idea of what friendship is. He does not understand what friendship is because of everything that happened and because he has been completely alone ever since then. And so then they hang out a few times and eventually he asks him, what is friendship? And he basically responds, friendship isn't something that is like tangible. It's not something you can measure. It's it's just a, a way of being, I guess. I mean, essentially. Yeah. And so then Shoya takes that and goes to Shoko and says, it has the same conversation, like, I want to be friends. This is why I think we could be friends. Also, during this time, uh, he thinks that she is dating someone called Yuzu Yuzunu? Uh... Uh, Yuzuru. 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 I wrote, I wrote that down wrong. Yuzuru. There, there are subtitles, mate. I know. I think I just messed up my own handwriting. It's fine. But uh, your handwriting is beautiful, the fuck? <laughs> Sometimes. The fuck? No, no, um, I get it. You, you were just so emotionally scarred at this point that you just didn't yes, give a fuck. so... Too emotionally scared. Who needs how, who needs to know how to write? Okay. Uh, Yuzuru does not like him. Obviously, they have the history. He's not approved. Shit happens with Yuzuru. She ends up running away. He, sorry, at this time, <laughs> ends up running away. They end up bonding for a little bit. They get to know each other. Eventually finds out Yuzuru is Shoko's younger sister, not her boyfriend. And there's a lot of time here where it's just them trying to establish a friendship between the four of them and then some of the other classmates that they have and some old friends from school. There's a lot of 
small things that happen that just them trying to figure out where they are with each other, like where they stand. And it's all very fragile. I think that's the best way to describe it because they're all tiptoeing around this huge thing that happened in elementary school where some of them understand that what they did to Shoko was bad and then some of them understand that what they did to Shoya afterwards was bad and then some of them feel like it wasn't their fault, some of them feel like it was their fault, some of them are lashing out at people. They're all feeling a whole lot and they don't really know what to do with this feeling because again, no one has stepped in to help them from the adult's perspective. And not only that, but it's very... It's just very real. Again, like they just hit the nail on the head with, you know, how teenagers in that situation would act. Because mm-hmm. two of them have been just just absolutely traumatized from what happened. And they're just trying to figure out like how to move on. Yeah. And they're both, you know, seeking each other out to try to, you know, make good on what happened in the past. They both and blame then, themselves. Yeah. And they don't know how to talk about it because they don't want to step on toes. Mm-hmm. And so, it, it's like you said, it's just like a feeling out process of how do they, you know, patch things up and move on. But there's no, like, real patching up going on. They're just trying to move on from it. And, again, it's like trying to put Band-Aids on a bullet wound, like, you got to do something to, you know, take care of that first before a Band-Aid's going to do anything. Yeah, yeah, they they have no disinfecting process right now. <laughs> and it doesn't help that there are other people in this who don't understand the situation previously, and they're just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're all friends, it's cool. And then there's one person, Ueno, who is actively, she actively does not like Shoko, and I assume has a crush on Shoya, although it's never actually said. And she is horrible, quite frankly. She's horrible. And it's never really discussed why she's horrible. The only thing that I can think of is that she really likes Shoya, and she can see that Shoya is interested in Shoko, at least. Shoko, uh, Shoya never has any kind of obvious romantic feelings for Shoko. Shoko does for him. But he clearly is very interested in Shoko as a person. Like, he wants to be friends with her. She is his main focus because of everything that happened in the past. He's learned sign language for her. He... All of his attention is on her. And I, I, that's, I'm assuming that she has a crush on him and that's why she reacts the way that she does. Mm-hmm. That could just be something that I have like put into the film. Maybe you interpreted it a different way. If you did, I'd be interested to know. I mean, it's it's really interesting because I feel like Shoko is very confused about how she's feeling. Oh yeah. Because again, she you know, openly like confesses to him and he doesn't get it. No. And again, it's it's cute how the misunderstanding happens. Yeah. Because Ski is, I like you. Yeah. But Suki is Moon. Yeah. And she's deaf. So she's trying to say, I like you. But he's like, Moon? Mm hmm. There's a really great TikTok of it. I need to find it. But anyway. Uh, so it's, it's so odd because, again, this is the turning point of the film to where I was like, they could have turned this into a love story. Yes. And I probably would have, I can't say I would have hated it because I don't It wouldn't know. have had the same impact. No, definitely not. Because it goes, like, up until this point, it goes against the story they're trying to tell. Because, again, it goes from redemption, which is all that the story needed to be about. And turning into a romance just doesn't fix anything. It would kind of, it would plant the idea of him accepting out of guilt in your brain Mm -hmm. and her, it would just be the setup for something incredibly toxic. I feel like, especially as they're so young. Oh yeah. Because if you don't, if there's no growth that comes out of it yeah, and you don't grow as people and things aren't dealt with properly, then it's just going to manifest into something bad. Yeah. And again, it kind of, 
does manifest into something bad, but it's not bad, bad. It's just, you know, it kind of turns everything on its head for the sake of growth. Yeah, it it becomes an internal issue as opposed to an external issue. I feel like if they were put together romantically, they would drag each other down, as opposed to this way with friendship, they are still having their own internal issues, but they're able to see each other from a different way than the kind of... I feel like romance would put blinkers on the two characters and they would have a bit too much tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I feel like it would wash out the story if they did that. So I'm glad they didn't as well. Oh yeah, 100%. So... They the whole they form a friendship group, then they all they go on this trip to the fair at the fair. Ueno is really mean to Shoko, basically saying this is all your fault, essentially, and you put Shoya through all of this, and because she wants the old friendship group to be the way that it was before Shoko came to the school because they were all really close. And she feels like that it is Shoko's fault that that group fell apart because if she had never arrived at the school, the group wouldn't have fallen apart, which is not accurate. They would have gone to different middle schools. They would have gone to different high schools. The group would have still dissipated as they grew up. That's just how life works. But that's the way that she's seeing it as a teenager. And Which, again, is accurate because she... You know, she just doesn't understand how to process things. And because what happened back in elementary school impacted her so much, she hasn't been able to get over it. Yeah, and she's going to look back at those days before Shoko came with rose-colored glasses, thinking that it was the best time of her life because she hasn't experienced enough yet to understand that life is only, like, that there is more best to come, you know? Mm -hmm. So... It turns out that Shoko had actually recorded this because Yuzuru, her younger sister, has been like photo- uh, photographing everything throughout this whole time. She's always got this this camera around her neck and she gave it to Shoko to take pictures at the top of the Ferris wheel. And so Shoko had been recording this whole conversation. And so Yuzuru takes that recording and shows it to Shoya. Shoya then understands that there's toxicity still there. So then they end up And he blames himself, 100%. He thinks that it's all his fault that all of this is happening because he is severely depressed and and guilt he's guilt-ridden because, again, no adult stepped in when all of this was happening to help him back in the time when it was was relevant, you know? They, They saw that he had bullied a child. They separated them. Then he was being bullied, and they still did nothing. Did they never learn? Well, not only that, but... He feels that way because he's the one who wanted to bring, you know, Uno into the group because he's he's trying to rectify everything. Yes. And so, you know, he's bringing people back little by little. Now, her showing up at the fair was not his intention. No. However, because of the interaction that happened, again, he feels guilty because if he hadn't have tried to bring her in in the first place then this never would have happened. And so Shoko getting slapped and having that interaction with Ueno, like he just feels guilty. He feels guilty about it all because he just doesn't, I can't, he just can't process everything properly. Yeah. Yeah. So then they meet up again at the Koi Fish Bridge and it's the whole group. And Shoya is distraught you know he's sitting there in the corner he has his hands over his head and everyone's trying to talk to him and they start fighting internally between the group and he just basically calls each one of them out one by one by one he says to you basically to each one of them you have not grown since that time in middle school you have done nothing to improve yourself since that time of middle school i have tried everything i can think of to rectify this situation to make things better but you have done nothing. You are still the same person as you were back then. Which, again, I understand his perspective from, and I empathize with him. He still has a lot of growing to go. He's not where he needs to be, but you can see that he has actively tried to improve himself, where mm. it does seem like everybody else is still kind of in that stagnant stage where they they haven't actively tried to improve themselves from that time. Mm-hmm. 
And again, he's in the right, but again, whenever he goes you, about it all wrong. Yeah. And whenever you put yourself in the place of saying that to other people, it's obviously going to backfire because even if what you're saying is right, human nature is very resistant to change. Yeah. And so being called on your bullshit is obviously going to hurt and piss you off. Yeah. And he he kind of goes a little bit too far as well, because the two new people who were there that weren't there in elementary school try and step in and say, hey, it's okay. And he basically says, you're outsiders, go away. And they're like, we thought you, we thought we were your friends. And so he shuts everybody out. And that's again where he is at fault for closing down. But I understand why he did that, because every time he has been vulnerable in the past, he's been like, had the door slammed in his face. Mm-hmm. So... He doesn't know how to express himself in a healthy way because no one has told him how. And then he kind of goes on the, you know, like he basically flips a switch of, okay, I've pissed everyone else off. Now I have to like step it up even more to try to make it up to Shoko. Yeah. And he starts to become like very overbearing. Yeah. He puts on this false happy face and, and for the rest of summer, he is, you know, extra happy he's going out there and he's saying this food is amazing let's go and do this thing that you know will be the best time ever and it's just the two of them hanging out unless her younger sister is along is coming along but it's just the two of them for for quite a while it seems and then eventually the hanabi festival the firework festival comes along and well their mother's birthday is a, a thing and and the mother is very is a very interesting subject throughout this because the mother is incredibly resistant to having him around at all. She despises him for what he did to Shoko as a child. And I can understand why from a mother's perspective, you just don't want that, that person that hurt your child in their life at all. That being said, she does go about it in the wrong way, in my opinion. But as a protective mother, I can understand why her feelings are incredibly extreme. So I get it. I just don't think it was handled properly. He was a child. Yeah, she did not handle it properly. But I get where she's coming from. I think her anger was misdirected. I really think that her anger should have been focused at the school, at the guardians, at the adults in the situation. Because yes, he should absolutely have been punished for what he did. So should the other students in the class. They should absolutely have faced consequences. They should absolutely have understood that what they did was so wrong. That being said, you cannot put the blame entirety on a child when there was someone there, that an adult there that should have been monitoring them. Um, so yeah, I think her angle was misdirected, but, but it's a very extreme. human reaction. A hundred percent. Again, like every, everything or every reaction to everything that happens in this film is very real. Oh like yeah. It's how people would naturally react. So I yeah. get it. No, a hundred percent. It's wrong on a lot of different levels, but it's just the way they portray everything is just to a T. Human nature, yeah. Yeah, like I it's, think well, it's that's a one of case the, study is a lot of what this is. Yeah, and I think it's it's so well done in that sense because it it teaches you how they should have reacted without showing you how they should have reacted. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such a, an incredible feat that this film had done has done. I think that they explain to you without ever telling you. What could have made this situation so much better, even though they're only showing you this one outcome? Mm -hmm. It's so delicately done, and it's such a masterful lesson and display. And of course, it's so human. It's so real. People don't react the way that you should react when experiencing something emotional. No. We all know how we're supposed to react in situations. We don't, though. No. Like, emotion is always going to be, like, the first factor in fight-or-flight situations. Yeah. And again, like, nine times out of ten with face with stuff like that, you're not going to react in the most ideal way. You're going to do what you think is best, you know, in that point in time. But then, you know, hindsight's always going to be twenty twenty for stuff like that. Yeah. So, that being said... They Hanabi. go to the, Yes, they go to the Hanabi Festival, they go see fireworks, and while they're there, they have a really good time. 
Shoko and Shoya are left alone for a moment and they talk for a bit and Shoko goes home because she says that she has to study. And Shoya's kind of a little bit confused about this. He's like, the fireworks aren't even over yet. And, but he lets her go. He's like, it's no worries. And then Yuzuru comes back and he says, hey, and she says, hey, can you go grab my camera? I forgot it at home. Can you go and grab it? And he's like, okay. But so funny little, well, not funny, but like little tidbit in their conversation between Shoko and Shoya Mm -hmm. there at the end, throughout a lot of the film, like emphasis is placed on the, you know, see you later. Yeah. Hand sign. Mm Mm-hmm. And during that interaction, you know, he's like, I'll see you later, and throws the see you later sign, and she says goodbye. Yeah. I don't know why, I just noticed it this time. I've seen this film a lot. Yeah, it's something that I noticed as well, that they that they had that. I thought it, it's an incredibly, it, it's foreshadowing, but yeah, it's, it's, especially on a rewatch, that would be an incredibly impactful moment. Yeah, like it, that hit me, and then I was like, oh my god. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, God. Why? What? Why? Mm -hmm. So when he gets to her apartment, he goes in, he lets himself in, and he sees the camera, and he then sees that the fireworks have started up again. And so he, and during that, he sees the silhouette of Shoko climbing up onto the balcony edge of their apartment building. And he very quickly realizes what's going on, because obviously he was in that position only months prior. So he runs through the apartment, opens the door, trips over a table, and doesn't quite get there in time. And by the time that he gets to her, she has already jumped. So he luckily manages to grab her hand while she's, like, hanging off the 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 balcony. He manages to grab her. He is hanging over. His, his The railing is too low. For his body, like, his weight distribution, the railing is too low. So his center of gravity is over the railing. And she, he's like, grab on, grab on, hold on, grab something. And, and finally she grabs onto, um, the, the edge of the, the balcony. She grabs onto like a rock there and she supports herself. And as soon as she does that and she gets herself secure, his, Obviously, his his weight distribution is all wrong. He finally slips over the edge and falls in her stead, basically. Then we just kind of see lights and flashing for a bit. And then we see them visiting in the hospital, friendship, her with a sling and her arm in a cast. Um, And uh, I'm assuming that's from him grabbing her arm and, and possibly dislocating her elbow or something from from him grabbing hold of her while she fell. I can't remember which yeah, arm. Yeah, I would assume, like, her shoulder probably got dislocated. Her elbow could have been dislocated. Yeah. Like, being just grabbed out of the air by your arm, with her being as small as she is, I'd say shit probably got dislocated. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that makes sense to me as well. So... She's she's got a sling on, um, and it's uh, it's so and everyone now feels a lot of emotions. Nobody really knows how they're feeling. Shoko's mom and Yuzuru go to Shoya's mom in the hospital, and they like get on the floor, groveling, apologizing to her about what happened because Shoko's mom thinks that Shoko did something bad again. Sorry, uh, Shoya's mom thinks that that Shoya did something bad to Shoko again. And that's why they're in this situation again. She doesn't think that, she doesn't know how they ended up here. So she just assumes that it's a repeat of what happened in elementary. And then Shoko's mom is like, no, actually your son saved my daughter. And it's a... it's one of those moments where you see the adults finally catch up, you know? Mm-hmm. All of this has happened, and finally the adults clue in that maybe these kids need a bit of help, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And I, it's not enough, it's not satisfying enough, but it's also real life. 
Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Again, it's just accurate, like how well they depict human nature. It's, yeah. Oh, it's unreal. Mm-hmm. I'm saying kids. They're like at this point, like five years younger than me, but still. I mean, hey, they're they're still in high school. Therefore, to me, they are still kids. They are babies. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Now all of the other the friends in the group are feeling all kinds of feelings. But when I was still gatekeeping their friendship, she learned nothing. Nothing. And Shoko feels so guilty. She feels like it's her fault that he ended up in the hospital. And she decides that she wants to fix what she broke. So in her mind, she broke the friendship group. She broke the his, like, future. Because he was completely isolated throughout that time. She broke his mental health. Then she broke his body by him falling off of this. And he's in, I, I assume... A medically induced coma, or uh, that, just, or he could be in an actual coma just an actual because he coma? did hit his head whenever he fell in the creek. Yeah, I don't know. He's unconscious. Either way, it's not said. He's also magically fine after it ends, which I don't really get, but we'll go with it. It's fine. <laughs> hey, anime logic. Leave it. <laughs> anime be. logic. So he has a sling, but he is just fine. I mean, he he wasn't fine, but then again, like I I guess it would just depend on. Like, how hard he hit his head versus, like, drowning. This is just like a mild concussion, but he cut his head open, but he almost drowned. Then, you know, he wakes up. Then, depending on how long he was asleep, which looked like a couple of weeks, somewhere in that sort of time, his concussion could have healed. Yeah, but also a couple of weeks in a coma doesn't just recover in a night, you know? No, but then again, it's all a brain thing. Yeah. Like, the brain could have done that just to, you know, keep him safe. But then whenever he wakes up, brain's fully functioning again. I would the have brain liked... is a weird fucking yeah. anomaly. I would have liked to maybe see some, like, uh, physiotherapy. Just, like, a little, a little, they could have been in a montage. Just a little bit of physiotherapy. That would have been fine. Just to no, satisfy no. me. No, no, Growth. That's all that matters. Growth. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> this is a, this is a film... About emotional growth. But what about physical growth? He's not trying to get swole. He's trying to make friends. But he's trying to learn how to walk again after being in a coma. He wasn't in a coma for fucking months. No, but like weeks in a bed would still at least give you a rash. Like. Yeah, but if the doctors actually massaged him, he would be fine. Ugh. 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 Also, how the hell did he just leave that hospital at night by himself? Like, was there no security? Okay, that was an anime trope. <laughs> like, is I, there not uh, some nurse there that's going to hit him over the head with a bedpan and tell him to sit back down again? I mean, it was night time. Maybe all the nurses were chilling at the nurse's station and he just slipped out the You back. have to walk past the nurse. There's no back door. You have to walk past the nurse. Specifically so that people can't sneak in and out of the hospital. You don't know that. Have you been I to did- a hospital in uh, an anime in Japan? No, I didn't think so. Okay, fine. I've not been to an anime Japanese hospital, but I have been to my fair share of hospitals. You can't just sneak in and out. There is security. No, no, it's fine. Oh. Again, it's Boy. anime. Suspend your disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> but also, they did so much so accurately. Why couldn't they have just, like, had Again, it's a, a guard? A they could have just. Growth. But, yeah, but they could have just had, like, a clip of him walking past a guard that's asleep. That would have been fine. I don't mind if they fell asleep at night shift. At least, like, he would have been fired or whatever. Like, but it explains it. It just. No, 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 because it doesn't fit the narrative of what they're trying to tell. They're trying to meet up because she's sad. And he's yeah, like, but he could have oh, no, ran past I can feel she's guard. sad. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, growth. Again, Versus 9 logic. out of 10 because stupid hospital. Okay, now now you're just, now you're thinking too much. 
10 no, out of 10 no, because no. beautiful story. Now I'm mad because I, it took me out of the film while I was watching it. I was watching it and I was so invested and I was so emotional. And then all of a sudden I was like, why the fuck did he just leave? Hello? Obviously you weren't emotional enough because you 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 had time to think about that. So okay. I, I, think, I think we need to reevaluate your priorities a little bit. Sure. Growth. No, 9 out of 10 because it's illogical. 10 out of 10 because beautiful. Because illogical. No, 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 no. Again, we we are watching a film. Therefore, it is not real life. It is a film. But it's based on a real life world. This is this is in our universe. Mate. Anime trope. Hospital trope. Do not care. They could have explained that away. They did. He left. No, but that's not it doesn't work like that. No. He left. I'm gonna strangle you. <laughs> you heard it here first. If I don't make it to next week's episode, you know why. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, okay. So everyone feels like shit because this is my level of fucks now. I mean- <laughs> Everyone feels bad because of that. She wants to go and repair everything. She's still blaming herself. So, you know, she didn't, she needs, like, she didn't, she, she wants to learn stuff, but she's still blaming herself for everything. So she didn't really, but she's being more active in stuff, I guess. So it's improvement. Well, I mean, she's trying and not only that, but she realizes that. Yeah. And so that's what she's telling people because since everybody else is blaming themselves, She's like, look, don't blame yourself, just grow. Mm-hmm. So again, she's, you know, she's trying to practice what she preaches, mm-hmm. but at the same time, she's time. trying to get everybody else on the train as well, because they obviously want to, but, you know, sometimes you got to give your friends a little bit of a nudge, you know, it's, it's being a good friend, you know, just come on join us. Yeah. You so, know, one of those situations. Mm-hmm. So then he gets an invite from Yuzuru to go to the school festival at the high school. And he goes after, yeah, hospital beat up. He goes, he wakes up from the coma. He goes, and he is experiencing so bad social anxiety. He uh, enters his classroom and everyone's like, oh my God, he's back. And he just freaks out and runs to the bathroom and shuts himself in. And he thinks like he's going to throw up. And then uh, Nagatsuka comes out and he's like, hey man, like I'm, and knocks on the door and he opens the door and Shoya's like, I'm sorry. And Nagatsuka's like, I don't give a shit about that. I'm so glad you're okay. And they hug and it's like, BFFs are back in town. It's good. We like that. And then when he leaves the bathroom, he then runs into a couple of the other friends in the group and they give him the thousand cranes or it's not finished, but they give him as many cranes as they had uh, for like good healing and good luck. I'm not entirely sure what it represents. It's good healing, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got teary eyed over that. It's so sweet. mm -hmm. And they apologize to him and he apologizes to them and they then kind of bond a little bit and then Ueno comes over and and she is still being a bitch, but she's being a bitch to Shoko while using sign language. So it's It's growth. It's growth, it's progress. It's and it it's kind of like you kind of understand her character a little bit more in that final scene, in the sense that you realize that she is that's just like she That's how she expresses herself, and it's not a good way of expressing yourself, but she's trying. And it's the first time you see her actively trying. Mm -mm. So, yeah, it's a a good little moment that they snuck in there towards the end. And then all of them go out to, like, the main outside bit, (laughs) you know, like the the courtyard entrance of the school or whatever, where all the stalls are. And he stands in the middle of the crowd, and this is the final scene of the film. He stands in the middle of the crowd, everyone's walking around him, and he basically takes a deep breath and looks up for the first time properly, and looks around him, and all of the X's on everyone's faces fall off, and he's able to see and hear everything for how it truly is and not for his own perception of what it is. And he starts 
crying. And it's so... It feels like he sees life, you know? Mm -hmm. For the first time. It's like that scene from Your Lion April where everything in Kosei's world goes from, you know, uh, like monotone to colorful. Yeah. It's like one of those types of scenarios to where it's just like, you know, for the first time in what feels like ages. Yeah. Like he can finally breathe. Yeah. I don't know if that scene fucked you up as much as it did me, but I'd read the manga before mm-hmm. we we went to go see this in theaters whenever it first played in theaters for the first time. Yeah. And it, like, I was bawling in the theaters. Like, this film just fucked me up on so many levels. Yeah. Like, there's so much I related with, so much that hit me home. And then just that final scene of, like, how the music stops. Then all the X's fall and, like, the background music just kicks up, which, let me just say, the background music on this film, 10 out of 10, beautiful, oh, yeah. perfect. It just, it helped amplify everything. Like, mm-hmm. it took away from nothing and helped everything. It was, ah, oh, so beautiful. And it just, oh, it fucked me up. Like, I'd, I'd bought a whole entire row. That's how many friends I had go with me to see this. Mm-hmm. And it... It just fucked me up. Like it's just, ugh. Mm-hmm. it's so real, so good. Like I, I don't have enough words to describe like how, like how much this film like tugs at my heartstrings and just again how much it got right. It touches on extremely, extremely heavy topics, but it handles them beautifully. And accurately, like it, it's a case study of human nature and how people would genuinely react in situations like this. And it's just, I don't have enough words. Like, there's a reason why I give it a 10 and why it is one of my favorite films, period. It's just, it's wonderful. Like, mm-hmm. I, I cannot say enough good about the film. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot. Watching this film is a lot. It's one of those films that I recommend that you watch. On a day when it's either just you or just, like, a person that's, you know, a small group of people. And I recommend, you know, getting some blankets and some good food and snuggling down and watching it maybe on a rainy day kind of thing. It's not, it's not something you're going to watch on a day when you're crazy busy. It's very intense. The feelings, yeah. It is a long film. Yes. Like, it feels so much longer than what it actually is. Like, a two-hour film Mm -hmm. felt like it was about four and a half hours long. And again, it does it beautifully. Like, at no point are you bored. Like, you're just captivated. It's just emotionally draining. Yeah, like, you, you feel every emotion that it wants you to feel. Yeah. Like, it is a roller coaster of... Like, Kyoto Animation just taking you on a fucking journey. And they do a fantastic job of just getting across every point and just telling a beautiful story just all the way to the very end of just redemption. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, 10 out of 10. Hi. (laughs) Watch it, but bring tissues, because holy fuck, you're going to need them. Yeah, yeah, it's a 9 out of 10 from me. It is so beautifully done. The background music, as Brad said, is is incredible. The storyline is really, really solid. The way that the humans just act is really, really solid. There are just those few things that aggravated me, like the hospital. There's a couple of other bits where it's just small things that are just very simply explained away that I found left me, like, just small plot holes. Just really, like that leaving the hospital scene. Just small things like that, that I feel like could have very easily just been manipulated a tiny bit to have been explained away so that there weren't those plot holes. It's just enough to be pet peeves for me. I don't feel like a lot of people will even consider them. So that's what's knocking off that point for me. But yeah, it, it's it's so good. Th- this is blue speak for 10 out of 10. Don't don't let her <laughs> don't don't let her confuse you. <laughs> yeah. And I don't cry. It successfully made me cry. So there you go. I called that. Yeah. Pro- yeah. Probably nowhere near as much as I did. Like, whenever I say I was basically in tears for the whole film, I mean it. 
just because again, there's there's so much that hit home with me. Like I might as well have been bawling in theaters whenever you see the video of the Ferris wheel scene. Whenever Shoko says that she, like she can't hate Ueno because she hates herself. Like that, that still to this day just hits me to a point that I still don't understand because I get it. Yeah. Like I am my own worst critic. And yeah. to this day, there's still like just self-loathing for myself that I feel I'm like that just hits mm-hmm. so hard and I'm there for all of it. So, yeah, yeah just watch it. Just be prepared because you're. Oh, that's going to fuck you up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it will. <laughs> and now <laughs> you, you, you're going to need a nap like I do. Uh, I'm, I'm a, actually, it's my bedtime. I'm old. I, I need to get to bed. As much as I want to go watch Tonica Coon or something to unwind, I, I need to go to bed. Yeah. So that, that everything? That everything that's, we got? That's everything I've got. All right. So if you like Blue, the person that gave the film a 10 out of 10, you can find her. <laughs> Uh, you can find her on Instagram and Twitter at Blue Lavender STM. She's on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash Blue Lavender. And she has an Instagram for her dog Tilly at the best Tilly Bean to where if you like doggo photos, that's the place you need to go. You, you need to go there after watching this film. That'll give you the boost of serotonin that you need. Oh, yeah. And if you're like Brad, you can find him on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash Gaming. You can also find him on Twitter under the same handle. He is at everything under that, so you can find him. And we also have uh, Instagram and Twitter for the podcast at BNB Anime. We're at BNB Anime on YouTube as well. We also have a website, www.bnbanime.com. So you can go there for all of our episodes that have been previously archived. You can also find a link to your favorite listening platform, or you can download them straight off the, the website if you feel like it. We also have behind the scenes stuff there, links to our IMDb for our voice acting work. You can find um, friends of the podcast, art stuff, all of that kinds of stuff are all on the website. Be sure to check that out if you're curious. So, yeah, let us know what your thoughts were on this film if you have seen it before. Let us know if there are any scenes that we've glossed over talking about that you think that you have opinions on because I know that we left a lot of stuff out in this film. It's, like we said, it's a long film. There's a lot that happened throughout it. So we did just kind of go over the key points of the plot line, but so much more happened throughout it. So also, if you haven't seen it and you did listen to all of the spoilers, uh, there is so much more in the film. So go watch it because we didn't cover even hardly any of everything. Yeah. Like, yeah. even if you listen to all of this, it's still going to fuck you up. Yeah. And there's still going to be moments that we, like, there's a scene with the grandma that we haven't even mentioned that is also in there as well. Like, there's so much more. So go watch that all. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, so uh, yeah, watch it. Let us know what your th- what your thoughts were. If you agree with me, or if you agree with Brad, or if you have different opinions, I want to know. Yeah. So thank you all so much for listening, Blue, and I greatly appreciate it. If you like what you heard, do be sure to hit the like, subscribe, whatever kind of follow button you have on whatever you're listening to. If you want updates of when the next episode drops, we typically drop on Sunday at. 9.30 EST, so you can find us on all of your listening platform thingies. And next week, editor, add in whatever the fuck we're going to be covering next <laughs> week, because I don't know where the fuck this falls in the timeline, mm-hmm. but yeah, you'll you'll have all of that info whenever this officially goes live. But until then, we'll catch y'all next time. Bye-bye. Bye.